Okay, this webinar is brought to you by Evaluate, the evaluation hub for the Advanced Technological Education Program. Evaluate advances evaluation um, in the ATE community by offering trainings, cultivating a community of people who care about evaluation, researching emerging, emerging topics in ATE evaluation, and collecting data about the ATE program. Be sure to check out our website to learn more. The slides from this webinar are already on our website, along with several other resources. You may also download these resources by following the link on the right side of your screen. The recording will be available within a couple of days, and we'll be sure to email that to you. I'm Samantha Hooker, and I'll be the moderator for today's webinar. Lissa Wilson-Betcho is our presenter today. She's the Principal Investigator of Evaluate, which is located at the Evaluation Center at Western Michigan University. We'd like to recognize those who've worked behind the scenes to help bring this webinar to you today, including Maureen Green, who I mentioned will be with us today for technical support in the chat, Lori Wingate, and Valerie Marshall from the Evaluate team. We'd also like to thank Carolyn williams Norin, our copy editor. We also want to thank Ellen House from the American Associ Association of Community Colleges, Elizabeth Hawthorne and Blake Erbach with Force ATE, and Elaine Kraft, Pam Silvers, and Emery DeWitt from Mentor Connect for their input in making this webinar. This webinar is designed for individuals funded by the NFC NSF's Advanced Technological Education Program, or ATE for short. The ATE program is focused on improving technician education, mainly through two-year colleges. It funds projects in high-tech areas like advanced manufacturing, engineering technologies, IT, nanotechnologies, and more. Before we get started, I do want to point out that the views expressed in this webinar are those of the presenters and do not necessarily reflect those of the National Science Foundation. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Lissa. Thanks, Samantha. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm so excited to be here with you today to talk about evaluation. Um, feel free to go ahead and introduce yourself in the chat, say where you're coming from, why you're here. Uh, we do have a number of interactivities throughout the webinar, so some polls and some chat questions, so be ready to engage with us. I'm going to go ahead and turn off our cameras for now so you can really focus on the slides, but we'll go ahead and turn them back on again at the question breaks. All right, well, we have a lot to talk about in the next hour, but I want to begin today by checking in with you. So often we find that people bring uh, some assumptions, some feelings, frankly, some baggage with them into conversations about evaluation. And that's completely fair. I just wanna know what you're all bringing in with you to today's webinar. So using the chat box on the right side of your screen, Share one word that comes to mind when you hear evaluation. So no judgments, don't hold back, good or bad, I wanna hear it. Okay, I see some comments coming in. So Megan says data, uh, Cassandra says value, I love that answer. Josh also says data, Kat says measurement. Ooh, Caroline says learning, love that. Brian says determination, yes. Varan analysis of issues. Erin says she thinks of a model. Donna says effectiveness. Tola says mastery. Ruth unearthing. Ooh, I love that one. You know, all of your responses are fairly descriptive and or positive, right? Kendra said improve, yeah. Well, normally we have people saying a mix of positive and negative responses. Normally we get people that say things like, terrifying or a lot of work or anxiety, right? And all of these responses are completely fair and acceptable associations. But uh, normally I say that I have one goal for today is to have everyone walk away with a more hopeful and positive outlook on what program evaluation can do for you and why you want to partner with your evaluation team for the sake of your projects and your participants. But since you all seem to have a pretty uh, good relationship so far with evaluation, I'm going to say that my goal today is to just to continue to build on that and really make sure that you walk away um, excited for what evaluation can do for you and your project. 
So as Samantha said earlier, Evaluate is funded by the National Science Foundation's ATE program. And we're gonna use a case example today of someone applying to the NSF ATE program. But I know this is not the case for all of you joining today. You might be applying to another NSF program, um, a philanthropic organization, or some other funding agency. So most grant funders are requiring project level evaluation. So the general purpose and overall process of evaluation will remain the same, whether you're funded by the NSF or another funder. So today we're gonna follow Jen Generickson. So she's gonna help us answer some questions about evaluation. And Jen has a great idea for an NSF ATE program. I'm sorry, an NSF ATE proposal. So she's working with her colleagues to pull together specifics about her projects, activity, and work plan. So most grant fundings will have a or a request for proposal, some type of description of their requirements. So in reading the NSF ATE solicitation, Jen comes across a section on evaluation. It states that all ATE funded work must be evaluated. She's never had an NSF grant and she's not entirely sure what this means. In fact, she has a lot of questions like, what even is evaluation? Why should she do it? How much is this gonna cost her project? Who can evaluate her project? And where can she find that person, that evaluator? So in today's webinar, we intend to answer all of these questions and any others that come up for you along the way. A quick caveat, today is part one of a two-part series of evaluation webinars for non-evaluators. So today is an intro, uh, an overview, uh, a quick start guide to what you need to know about evaluation as a prospective grantee, grants professional, or administrator. On August 9th, in part two, we'll dive into some of the more details and specifics about how uh, precisely to write an evaluation plan for your ATE proposals. So in both webinars, I really wanna connect you back with the wealth of resources on the Evaluate website, so that when you inevitably have a question about evaluation later, you know where to find answers. Let's start with the most fundamental question of what is evaluation? At its core, evaluation is a process of learning. Program evaluation can help to answer questions like, did my project work? Why did it work? Who did it work for? Are the project impacts equitable? And what aspects can be improved? So learning from an evaluation should be driven by you, the project staff, and those served by the project. In the ATE context, this might be students, faculty, or business and industry partners. It can be helpful to ask these groups what they might want to know about your project in advance. So we'll continue to talk about this, but the best evaluations are a partnership between the project team and the evaluation team. Your evaluators are there to be your partners in learning. They're not there to catch you doing something wrong. They're not there to mark you down or point out your flaws. They're not auditors. They're not there to conduct a performance review. They are there to work with you to make your project better for the sake of your project and ultimately your participants. There are no failed projects. Just like in any science experiment, there are no bad data. All data are a chance for learning and for improvement. Unmet project goals are an opportunity to understand what didn't work. And knowing what doesn't work is a step closer to knowing what does work. Okay, so what does this all look like in practice? Well, boiled down, evaluation involves four main steps. First, asking important questions about a project's processes, outcomes, or other dimensions. This is about making sure the evaluation focuses on the things that really matter. This is where your project's learning desires come in. These questions, they scope the rest of the evaluation. The next step is gathering evidence that will help answer those questions. So evidence for evaluation is often gathered through research tools like focus groups, interviews, surveys, or observations. And in the ATE program, evaluations often involve utilizing a college's institutional data. They may use results from course evaluations and sometimes include feedback from panels of experts or advisors. Then we have to make sense of those data. So we interpret the results and answer the evaluation questions. 
when it comes to interpreting or making meaning of the data that we collected, evaluations almost always look for project strengths and weaknesses. In assessing outcomes, we should determine the magnitude or the extent of the outcomes and their practical significance for the people involved. This is often done by comparing to some sort of benchmark or standard. And then the last step is the use of information for project improvement, accountability, and planning. The use of evaluation findings for decision making is a key part of the evaluation cycle. So I said this was the last step, but it's not really, because the evaluation should then inform decisions about the next project, and this cycle of learning starts all over again. So now Jen has a better sense of what it means to have her project evaluated, but she's still unsure of why she should do it. So why should she have her project evaluated? Why should she want to have her project evaluated? Well, I said it before and I'll say it again. Evaluation is all about learning. We typically talk about three main benefits that come from evaluations. First, learning about what works and what doesn't work in order to improve your project. Second, sharing those learnings back with the National Science Foundation or your funder. As your funder, they want to learn about what changes have happened because of their investment in your project. And third, providing evidence of the effectiveness of your project, both for your project and for others who are trying to do similar things. Evidence of what works can add to the larger field of technician training or whatever context you're in. So a maxim we frequently hear is the most important purpose of evaluation is not to prove, but to improve. So whereas research is typically conducted for the sake of building knowledge, evaluation is intended to inform decision-making. The first purpose of evaluation is for improvement and decision-making. Utility or the usefulness of an evaluation is actually a standard of quality which evaluations are judged by. Evaluation findings are intended to be used. Let's look at some examples from the ATE context of how evaluations might be used by projects. So in the first example, evaluation findings might highlight a particularly effective recruitment strategy for women in a cybersecurity program. The project decides to lean into this success and shift additional resources to that recruitment strategy. In a second example, an evaluator might share that faculty in a professional development workshop had a particularly difficult time understanding a unit on semiconductors. This is a red flag that indicates the project might want to revisit that unit or provide additional instruction. For a final example, evaluations can be particularly important in highlighting issues of equity and inclusion around a project's impact. An internship program funded by a project might be particularly helpful for white students, but Hispanic students don't feel a sense of belonging and they can't fully engage with industry partners. Evaluation can unearth these patterns and give you an understanding of what you might change in your project and why. The second purpose of an evaluation is for accountability. So as a funder, the NSF does require an independent evaluation. In order to be in compliance with the requirements of an ATE grant, you must evaluate your project. So just like you want to learn about the effectiveness of your project, so does the NSF. At a basic level, evaluation enables a high degree of accountability. Individual grantees are held accountable for their use of federal resources and the information helps NSF then be accountable to Congress and justified continued support for the program. Projects funded by the NSF have to submit reports annually. So these reports detail the project's activities and outcomes for the past year. Reporting evaluation findings and how those findings were used to improve the project encourages projects to be accountable for the work they proposed. It's helpful to know what the NSF will expect in, uh, from your reporting, even at the proposal stage, because knowing what you'll be asked now will allow you to prepare. The third purpose of evaluation is to generate evidence. So we hear a lot about evidence-based practices or high impact practices. And we trust that systematic research and evaluation of these efforts provided evidence that they work. So just as you borrow from other successful interventions, one day someone, might else, someone else might borrow from yours. Your evaluation provides evidence of what works and what doesn't, 
both equally important learning opportunities. For those applying to the National Science Foundation, if you've been previously funded by them, you'll have to begin your proposal with a section called results from prior NSF support. This subsection has to include evidence of specific outcomes and results, including metrics to demonstrate the impact of your project activities. These come from your evaluation. So it's important to consider at the start of your project, what kind of evidence you might want to have at the end of your project. So let's look at some examples. So here are a set of three statements that could show up in a results from prior support section in a future proposal that Jen submits. So take your time to read each example carefully, then answer the poll question to indicate which examples would be most compelling to reviewers as evidence of outcomes. Samantha, can you go ahead and launch that poll? Oh, perfect. I see it popped up on the left hand, I'm sorry, on the right hand side of your screen. So I'll stay quiet for about a minute to allow you to read these. All right, I see that a majority of our participants today have responded to the poll. So let's go ahead and take a look at each of these examples more closely. So example A only said what they were funded to do. So Celeste Carter, who is the NSF ATE program lead, said that this is all too common in ATE proposals. People kind of just cut and paste from their prior proposal, talking about what they're going to do and not necessarily providing evidence of what they've done. So this wouldn't be considered compelling evidence of outcomes. Example B only reports on activities. So it includes a lot of numbers, 150 students enrolled, 300 students benefited, 400 potential students. These are great, but they're just counts of what happened. And so there isn't actually any evidence of what happened to the student as a result of these activities. In example C, it answers the question of, so what? So what happened to those students after they participated? Their pass rates increased, they got jobs. It includes evidence of what changes were brought about because of the project. So this is the type of evidence that you want to aim for. Okay, so now Jen has a good grasp on what evaluation is and what it looks like in practice and why she wants to do it. But her big question is, what is it going to cost her project? But before we dive into that question, I'm gonna hand it over to Samantha for our first of three question breaks. Thank you, Lissa. If you have any questions, you can go ahead and put those into the chat box and I'll address them. All right. I don't know, Alyssa. Looks like they're keeping up. Um, maybe we'll just give it a, a little couple seconds here and see if um, anybody would like to add a question. Yeah, no problem. I mean, it seems like a lot of our attendees today came in with a really good foundation base knowledge and evaluation. We do have two more question breaks. So if there's a question that you're sitting on or you want to make sure it comes up, definitely keep it in your back pocket. But we can move on to the next section for now. All right. So now let's get into that question that uh, I think is on your mind. So how much does a project evaluation cost? Well, here's the expert 
excerpt from the ATE program solicitation about the evaluation requirement. So it states that evaluation, the evaluation budget must match the scope of the proposed evaluative activities. And that's really important, but it's not really satisfying for people who just want to get a figure into their budget that they can work with. So the general rule of thumb is that 10% of a project's costs should be allocated for evaluation. And that's for evaluation in any context, not just ATE. So that's a good place to start, but then you can go up or down from there, depending on what level of evaluation is needed for your project. So a variety of factors can influence a project's evaluation budget. So some examples of those factors include the type of data that the evaluation will be collecting. So qualitative data tends to be more time intensive um, when it comes to collecting, cleaning, and analyzing. Therefore, evaluations that heavily rely on qualitative data may be more e expensive. Whether the data has been collected or whether it will be new, so existing data may be less time consuming for the evaluation team compared to when they need to gather new data, making new data more expensive. Different evaluators interact with projects differently. So if you're looking for an evaluator who will be highly responsive to changes in activities, timelines, or data needs, that may be more costly than a less responsive evaluation. Similarly, an evaluator who is more involved with meetings or decision-making might be more costly. Evaluation efforts can be shared between external evaluators and internal evaluation efforts. So more assistance from internal evaluation can reduce the cost burden on your external evaluators. The more reliance on your external evaluation team, the more costly the evaluation. Travel time also affects the evaluation budget. So you may want to consider how far your evaluator will have to travel for meetings or site visits. Longer travel times will lead to a higher evaluation budget. So I want to point these out not as a formula to write your evaluation budget, but as some guideposts to understand how that 10% rule might be affected by the types of evaluation your project is looking for. So it's always best to have an open conversation with your evaluator about your needs and their needs. No matter the fact is, if evaluation is going to bring value to your project, uh, you have to fund it adequately. So let's look at what this might mean in practice. So remember our friend Jen, let's say that she is asking for the maximum amount for an ATE project. So her total project budget would be $650,000. So most academic institutions apply a facilities and administrations rate called an F&A rate or sometimes referred to as an indirect rate. So all institution rates are different, but let's say that Jen's institution F&A rate is 25%. So that means that $130,000 of her total budget would be made up of indirect funds, leaving $520,000 of the budget for direct operating funds. So the 10% rule for evaluation is typically calculated uh, based on this indirect cost. I'm sorry, I said that incorrectly. It's typically based on the direct operating cost. So if Jen dedicates 10% of her direct budget to evaluation, that would mean that there would be $52,000 over the lifespan of the grant for evaluation, which would be around $17,000 per year. So these funds will go towards an evaluator's time, as well as their travel expenses and overhead costs. There may be other miscellaneous expenses, but these are the main ones. Evaluation budgets should reflect what's needed for a given project. So again, this is just a very rough guideline. So Jen is on her way to understanding what evaluation is and how much it costs. And we'll tackle her next question about who can evaluate her project. But first, uh, we tend to get a lot of questions about evaluation budget, so we want to take a quick break here uh, to answer any questions you have about evaluation budgets. Thanks, Lisa. There was one question um, about indirect versus direct costs, but you answered that by the end of um, the slides. So uh, we are all set there and there are no additional questions. It looks like uh, Milton just came in with a question. So you don't even need me. Milton asks, 
<laughs> Go ahead. Okay. Um, what happens when you need to generate new quantitative data? Does that increase the cost? Um, I think, you know, in that in that slide that was comparing more costly and less costly evaluation, it's really about that comparison, right? So I think qualitative data, because it's about those stories, really that narrative um, is more costly than quantitative information. Even though, particularly in an ATE context, that quantitative data can be harder to access than you may originally think. So if your institution is um, lucky enough to have a really well-structured institutional research office, that's definitely a resource that you want to take advantage of to help get those quantitative data. Okay, and could you confirm that direct cost is the same as program cost? Hmm. Um, I'm not quite sure how you're using the term program cost per se, so I don't want to just straight up say that those two are the same thing. So in uh, for an ATE project, because uh, these funds from the National Science Foundation are typically being given to uh, higher education institutions, those institutions have a facilities and administrations cost. So essentially a percentage of the money that comes straight from NSF is immediately taken off the top. So those uh, are colloquially referred to as the indirect funds, which leaves your direct project cost. And so that is typically what that 10% is calculated on. Okay. And what are the specific advantages of working with an independent evaluator at the beginning stage of your hmm. proposal prior to submission and hopefully funding related to cost? Ooh, what a great question, Greg. Um, okay, so uh, we talk about this a little bit later, but uh, most independent uh, external evaluation evaluators will work with you in the pre-award stage. So this is be before you've submitted your proposal. They will have calls with you. They will help you um, develop your evaluation plan. They'll write that evaluation plan for you. And a lot of ATE evaluators will actually um, review the rest of your proposal as well. So evaluators can be really great thought partners in thinking through the underlying logic of the, the project you're proposing, as well as making sure that the outcomes are really meaningful and well-defined. Most evaluators will do that pre-award work um, for free. Well, I say free, I shouldn't say free. I should say they will do it without charging you with the assumption that they will then be hired as the evaluator for that effort if it's funded. So when you ask about what the benefit of this is related to cost, one, I truly believe that working with an evaluator in the pre-award stage improves the quality of your proposal, which improves the uh, probability that it'll be funded. To a lot of times we see an evaluator who can work in that pre-award stage and post-award stage, the evaluation process itself goes smoother. So in terms of costs, it means that they are actually spending less time um, in that post-award when they are charging you for their time to understand your project, to understand you and your team and what you're really looking for. So I do think that there is actually a cost benefit to working with an evaluator before you are funded. However, that can rely on your institutional policies, which we'll talk a little bit about in a second. Okay, and how much of the budget do they need to plan for going towards the college? For example, if they have an administrative assistant, does she get additional money for working on the project as needed? Um, Lori, I am actually going to, uh, there are some great uh, resources on the specific different budget categories that I know Mentor Connect has, but I also think that uh, other groups like uh, Force ATE could could uh, do a really good answer to this. There are also, make sure you check with your institution because there's a lot of institutional policies on who and how you can put on external grants. Okay, and then um, Lori did have a follow-up question. Uh, wondering if the school is responsible then for paying the, for the evaluator before funding? 
Um, but I believe that was previously. It's de it's a good reminder. So it's it's the school is not necessarily responsible for paying the evaluator before you receive your grant funding. A lot of evaluators will do that work. Um, I don't want to call it pro bono, right? But I want to call it that they, I want to say that they understand it's a cost of working, right? Developing essentially those uh, responses to requests for proposals, right, is how uh, contracting evaluators get their work. And so there's always some aspect of upfront work in which they can't charge for. So they will actually put that into their operating costs. I hope that makes sense. Okay, and that looks like all for this question section. Yes, I'm so glad. So Beth jumped in and, and uh, said, please email me about the admin assistant. I'm sure she can give a much better answer than I did. <laughs> Thanks, Beth. All right, well, let's go ahead and move on to the next section. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about, you know, who can evaluate and how do you find this person? So, as I just said, who can do the evaluation? So, Jen has a lot of smart people on her team. So, she's just wondering if they can do it internally. Well, the short answer to that question is no, um, because the NSF ATE program specifically states that the evaluator must be independent of the project. So, first we should tackle the question, what counts as independent? So according to the ATE program solicitation, the evaluator may be employed by a project's home institution as long as they work in a separate unit that has a different reporting line than the project's home unit, like a different academic department or an institutional research office. So while some larger institutions, they might have the evaluation capacity in other departments, this can become practically impossible at smaller institutions. So NSF asks for the evaluator to be independent in order to provide a sense of credibility and reliability to the findings. Sometimes you're just gonna need to do a gut check. Will there be any incentive for this person to sway results one way or another? Uh, if you're on the fence, it might be better to go with someone outside of your institution. So an evaluator outside of your institution or project has the highest level of independence. So they'll be able to tell you like it is without fear of political ramifications. It can be really difficult to find an evaluator that's right for your project. When looking for an evaluator, it's important to know that there are no specific degrees or certifications that are required to call oneself an evaluator. There are a wide variety of companies and organizations that conduct project evaluations. Some are small evaluation consultants, others are large evaluation centers. Sometimes these large evaluation centers are based at four-year institutions or large research conglomerates. So here are some things that you want to look for when you are searching for an evaluator for an ATE project. You wanna be careful to look for someone who has experience as an evaluator. Someone that has strong research skills, is a good communicator and who will be responsive to your situation. It can also be helpful for someone to have an understanding of the NSF or two-year college context, or an understanding of your context if you're outside of ATE. So it's not always easy to find someone with the perfect mix of credentials, but let's look at some examples. So let's help Jen select an evaluator for her project. So as Samantha launches the poll for this question, let's take a moment to review the credentials for each of these three evaluators. Then use the poll that should appear on the right side of your screen to make your recommendation about which one Jen should approach for her project. So if you have any reservations or about your suggestion or additional questions that you would ask, use the chat to explain any of your concerns. So I'll give you again about a minute to read these and respond.
All right, I see the responses have started to slow in the poll. So let's take a look at each of these evaluators. So like I said, you know, sometimes it can be difficult to find an evaluator that is a good fit from their resume alone. So some follow-up questions might be needed. So if we look at evaluator A, they seem to have a good knowledge of two-year colleges, technician education, and student services. So I would want to know more about their experience as an external evaluator of grant-funded projects. Accreditation has a lot in common with project evaluation, but it's not the same thing. Evaluator B looks like they have great credentials when it comes to evaluation, but I'd want to know how much time they really have to work on this project. Given that they're working on 25 other evaluations, I would suspect that they have a team working with them. So I'd also want to know who would actually be working on this project and what are their credentials. They say they have prior experience with NSF funded projects. I would ask them if they have experience with ATE in particular. Evaluator C certainly knows two-year colleges and NSF, but it's not clear if they have any expertise when it comes to research methods and running evaluations. So I would ask about those things. So I don't mean this to be a trick question, but like I said, you know, it is hard to find the perfect evaluator based on their resumes alone. So it's always good to ask follow-up questions and ask for additional information before you finalize the evaluator you're gonna work with. So now Jen has a better idea of who she might be looking for, but where does she look? Evaluate has done some research around this, and most ATE projects actually find their evaluator through word of mouth. So make sure you ask colleagues and other ATE PIs you know if they have an evaluator that they like. But I also know that that answer isn't helpful for everyone. So let's look at some other options. Unfortunately, Evaluate does not currently have a master list of all possible evaluators for your ATE project. However, we do have some good suggestions on where you might want to uh, look for an evaluator that would meet your needs. So first off, the American Evaluation Association hosts a national directory of evaluators. You can search in this directory by areas of expertise or location, for ATE projects, we suggest using search terms like STEM, education, community college, or NSF. You can use other search terms specific to your context as well. There are also local affiliates of the American Evaluation Association. So these regional groups, they sometimes have their own directory, which can list people who are not included in the national directory. So I think it's always good to check both. While an evaluator doesn't have to be local to your area, it can sometimes cut down on travel costs in an evaluation budget or increase the evaluator's awareness of local needs. Expanding the bench is an initiative committed to diversifying evaluation and evaluating and elevating culturally responsive and equitable evaluation. They also host a searchable database of evaluators. So similar to the ATE database, uh, the AEA database. Wow, I'm really tripping over my words today. Um, we recommend that you use search terms to find evaluators with experience that are similar to your context and what you're looking for. And finally, we partner with ATE Central to host a map of evaluators who are currently evaluating ATE projects. So these, this list of evaluators are those who are already working on ATE projects, uh, but do not encompass all of the possible evaluators who you might work with. Um, but these evaluator profiles will list information such as their company name, contact information. You can also see their geographic location on the map and their uh, ATE projects and STEM disciplines are color coded and you can look at those as well. So now all of this really assumes that you're able to start looking for an evaluator now before you've been funded. But this process of procuring an evaluator can be a bit more difficult depending on your institution or organization's policies. I wish I could give you a straightforward map of what this looks like at your organization, but it's different in each state and sometimes even in institutions within that state. So we recommend that one of your first conversations is with someone in your procurement or contracts office. So they should be able to tell you the specifics of your particular institution. 
but there are two basic paths. So in the first path, your institution will allow you to name an evaluator in your proposal and work with them pre-award, meaning right now while you're developing your proposal. This can be a really great way to connect with your evaluator and get their insights and feedback, not only on the evaluation plan, but on your project goals and objectives. Like I said before, evaluators spend a lot of their time thinking about what constitutes meaningful outcomes and how to measure them. In this situation, many evaluators will conduct the work upfront without payment. So they work with the agreement that they will be hired as the evaluator if you receive the grant. But make sure to talk with your evaluator upfront about how they handle these situations and what kind of boundaries they might place around their time and effort in that pre-award stage. In the second path, your institution might say that you need to wait until the project is funded in order to select an evaluator. So this means that you will not be able to have an external evaluator write your evaluation plan for your proposal. You or someone on your project team will need to write it. So while this may seem overwhelming, know that a lot of other ATE projects are in a similar boat. And Evaluate has a lot of resources that can help support you. So first, Evaluate has a checklist for what content should be included in an evaluation plan for an ATE proposal. And this is exactly the information that we'll dive into during our next webinar on August 9th. I'm providing the checklist here in case you're ready to get started, but know that we'll talk through every bullet on this checklist in August. Second, Evaluate offers free one-on-one -on -one technical assistance in developing evaluation plans. Anyone involved in or applying to the ATE program can take advantage of our evaluation coaching, but I've seen it be particularly useful for those writing ATE proposals who cannot contract with an evaluator in that pre-award stage. You can read more information or request a meeting with one of our three wonderful coaches on our website. All right, as we reach the end of our webinar today, you know, we've talked about a lot of things. Uh, to keep them all straight, we've put them together in this toolkit of resources that you can download right now on the handouts tab to the right side of your screen. So this outlines the essential steps that you will need to take in the pre-award stage of an AT evaluation. So the first step is actually pre-work. And the good news is, is that you've already done it. <laughs> so by attending this webinar, you've taken steps to understand the purpose and value of evaluation to your ATE project. So check that one off. The first thing that you need to do is to understand your institution's requirements for procuring an evaluator. Call your procurement's office, purchasing or fiscal agent or grants manager to ask about the specific policies at your organization. You can refer to our, our evaluator procurement map to understand a macro view of what this process might look like. If your institution will allow you to name an evaluator in your proposal, your next step will be searching for an evaluator that fits your project needs. So Evaluate's guide to finding and selecting an evaluator summarizes the information we discussed today and can be a really handy guide to refer to throughout that process. We also have a list of questions that you can ask evaluators during an interview to determine whether or not they're a good fit for your project. If your institution will not allow you to name an evaluator in your proposal, your next step will be drafting an evaluation plan for your AT proposal. Like I mentioned, Evaluate has a whole host of resources dedicated to non-evaluators who find themselves developing an evaluation plan, and links to all of those resources I mentioned are in this handout. So your final step will include reviewing your evaluation plan with your full proposal to ensure alignment of activities, outcomes, and goals. And finally, you submit your ATE proposal. So Jen is feeling pretty good about her evaluation now, and I hope you are too. So we are gonna end with one more question break to close out our webinar today. Please ask any and all questions you have about evaluation or feel free to reach out to me afterwards. Samantha, I'll pass it to you. Okay, thank you, Lissa. Um, we did have one question that was answered in the chat, but I think it's probably worth uh, answering out loud just in case other people have the same question. 
Um, and that was, could you use an evaluator who has NSF experience but also serves as an evaluator for another grant at your institution? Yeah, and I see Greg answered yes. Yes, absolutely. I agree. Yeah, you know, I mentioned that most ATE projects uh, reported that they found an evaluator based on word of mouth. So they asked their colleagues, hey, who do you use? Who do you like working with? Um, and with that kind of recommendation uh, is a really successful way of finding uh, an evaluator that'll work for you. Okay, great. Um, there are no other unanswered questions right now, but if anybody has any, they can go ahead and put them in the chat. Oh, we have one there. How can we determine that a project needs an evaluation? Milton, can you uh, say whether or not you are coming from the ATE context or from a different context? And while you respond to that in the chat, because I think that'll affect um, my answer, but my personal answer is that every project can benefit from evaluation. Um, if you are going to be putting funds into any type of intervention, any type of project or program, you want to know if you're doing what you say you're going to do. Uh, and you do that through evaluation. So a lot of funded efforts will require it. So for example, if you're in the ATE uh, context, if you are applying to uh, the National Science Foundation for an ATE grant, you are required to have an external evaluator. And a lot of other programs within NSF have that same requirement. Um, a lot of other funding agencies within other contexts, so other governmental organizations, philanthropic foundations, um, they are starting to do the same thing and require evaluation. But that looks really different in different areas. So make sure that you are looking at that solicitation or the um, request for proposal to make sure that you are understanding the type of evaluation they're looking for and any additional requirements they have. Okay, if the cost of an evaluation is high, should it always be done? I would answer that question with a question, right? Like why, why would you consider the cost of the evaluation high? Um, I think that there is always a conversation to be had between the project team and the evaluation team. So if you think that uh, an estimate for an evaluation has come back at what you feel like is an unreasonable cost, ask them, right? Tell them that. Say, why is this so high? Can you please explain this? Um, particularly when submitting uh, proposals to anywhere, but also the NSF ATE program, it's really important to make sure that the cost of your evaluation is really justified in your proposal. So particularly in your budget justification document, you can have an entire section to explain why the evaluation budget line uh, is the cost that it is. And make sure you're including things like um, the, the types of uh, data collection methods they're using. We'll talk about this in August, but you know it can be really helpful to have a, an evaluation data matrix, which allows you to be specific while also condensing a lot of information into a small amount of space. Um, and that will really help explain why your evaluation cost may seem high to people who aren't quite sure uh, the purpose of evaluation. Okay, and Lisa, that is the last of our questions. You're welcome, Milton. I was just reading Greg's uh, comment in there as well. Yes, I agree. I mean, I do think that one thing I, I want to stress is the sooner you can work with an evaluator, the better. It, it improves your chances of being funded. It improves the quality of your proposal. It improves the quality of your project. Um, Evaluators can be a really wonderful thought partner in developing proposals. And 
I frequently find that ATE evaluators go above and beyond the scope and expectations of um, what is typically considered an evaluator. And so someone who's worked within the ATE program before just has so much uh, knowledge and experience and expertise in what NSF reviewers are looking for, what makes an ATE project successful, um, and can really, you know, bring that special sauce to your proposal that gives you that edge. Furman asked about the first part of Greg's comment, where he said, as an evaluator, I no longer do bids from institutions where there's zero chance of funding. Uh, I mean, Greg would have to explain why he thought that that had zero chance of funding, but, you know, recognize that evaluators are, uh, you know, they're trying to figure out what makes sense for their finances as well. So they're constantly balancing um, what they charge, what they can do, what they feel is feasible, what they think is a good investment. Um, I do not, I don't want to say that if an evaluator says they can't work with you, it means that you have no chance of funding. I don't think you should take that. Um, but I, a lot of people will really lowball uh, valuation budgets, right? So they'll say, uh, can you do interviews with 40 students every single year, provide me um, immediate reports um, every six months, uh, but I only have, you know, $10,000 for you a year. And that's just not enough funding to do that kind of evaluative work. So uh, even though it can feel like a hard pill to swallow when you're doing your project budget to say that you need to take a chunk of that budget to put to evaluation, because it feels like it's not yours, when you're giving it to an external consultant, that those funds really are for you. Like think of your evaluator as someone who is uh, aiming to the same goals, right? They're, they're there to help you to understand what's working and, and how you can improve. Um, yeah, Greg just put time is money, right? So, I mean, you, you can't have a really, really low evaluation budget and then expect just this high quality, very responsive um, work. Those, Two things just don't go together. Yes, Olivia said people often underestimate the funding that's needed to do good work they want to be done. I completely agree. Any other questions on your mind? Things you want to know? Now you're all really convinced. <laughs> Thanks, Furman. Well, I really think that building this foundation of understanding why we evaluate and how that can help improve your project really does provide the basis for every other interaction you're gonna have with evaluation or your evaluator. Um, understanding how it serves your project, how it serves your students, your participants, um, is really gonna set you up for that collaboration, that relationship with your evaluator. Um, I've heard a number of ATE projects feel like either they're afraid of their evaluator, right? Like they're gonna say something bad. Um, and I wanna say that you shouldn't be afraid of your evaluator. Like your program officer from the National Science Foundation, they want to know the good things and the bad things about your project. And by telling them bad things, they're not gonna uh, you know, turn around and penalize you for that. But they do want to know how you are learning from that. So if something didn't go well, what are you doing now? What are you doing next year? How are you going to do things differently? And so not only receiving those evaluation findings that say this didn't go so well, but then explaining how your project digested that, how you interpreted it, and what actions you're going to take because of that evaluation finding. That's really the purpose here. It's that that cycle of change that we talked about at the beginning, asking questions, figuring out how to answer them, but then using those answers to improve your project and then asking new questions. Okay, thank you everybody. Um, please follow us on LinkedIn for the most current information on upcoming events, evaluation resources and helpful tips and tricks. And don't forget to bookmark our website, evaluate.org. 
We hope it can be a source of knowledge and community for you as you move forward with your potential projects. And remember to mark your calendars for our second webinar and evaluation specifically for those planning to submit to the ATE program on August 9th at 1 p.m. Eastern. And this webinar will be discussing detailed strategies and insights to help develop evaluation plans for NSF ATE proposals. As we close today, please take a few minutes to take our feedback survey.